my name is uh, Jones, and uh, today we are going to look at the classification of uh, drugs. Okay, this is uh, Unit 4 in our series of comprehensive uh, uh, study of uh, PowerPoint and notes in uh, pharmacology. Okay, so I welcome you to this lesson, and if you have not listened uh, to other lessons within this compilation, I urge you to listen to those notes uh, unit by unit, okay, so that uh, you can uh, know where we have come from and uh, see what we have covered. The general objective of uh, this lesson is that by the end, uh, you should be able to acquire the knowledge and understanding of uh, classification of uh, drugs. The specific objective of this lesson is that um, you should be able to describe the classification of the following drugs, that is analgesics, antibiotics, antiviral agents, and fungals, antiprotozoa, disinfectants, or antiseptics. Okay, so let us now start looking at classification of drugs. A drug is a mixture of uh, substances used in the diagnosis, uh, cure, and um, in the prevention of uh, disease. Drugs are classified according to the properties they have and the types of disease-causing organism that they target. When you know the classes of drugs, you will have acquired the knowledge of how to treat condition accurately. Hence, you will hasten the treatment of the patient and subsequently uh, save lives in time. There are many classification of drugs, but uh, for the sake of uh, this study, we have categorized the six main classes of uh, drugs. So we have uh, one analgesia okay as the first class of drug that you're going to use okay then uh, two we have uh, antibiotics three we have uh, antiviral agents then four we have antifungal drugs then uh, five we have antiprotozoal drugs and uh, six we have uh, disinfectant or antiseptics so now we are now looking at analgesic drugs an analgesia is any member of the group of drugs used to relieve a pain due to several causes. So an, okay, that is the absence, algesia sensation. So you want the absence of a sensation of pain. So an algesia is any member of the group of drugs that are used to relieve pain due to several causes. They are divided into three subgroups, namely analgesia used to treat mild, moderate, and severe pain. So we have uh, three uh, subgroups here under analgesia for mild treatment of pain, for moderate treatment of pain, and uh, severe treatment of pain. However, you must know that there are two primary types of analgesia. We have narcotics. These are opioid-based analgesic drugs. And then we have non-narcotics or non-opioid drugs. These are analgesics that are used to treat uh, the above types of pain. So mostly when you're talking of non-opioids, you are talking of non steroid and inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Okay, so types of analgesia. So we have narcotics and we have non-narcotics. Examples of narcotics include uh, morphine, uh, codeine, and uh, pethidine. Then examples of uh, non-narcotics include uh, paracetamol and uh, non steroidal anti anti-inflammatory drugs, abbreviated as NSAIDs. Okay, for instance, aspirin. Okay, so narcotics, they are used uh, to treat uh, moderate uh, to severe pain. Okay, so when you want to treat moderate to severe pain, mostly the choice of drug will be narcotics. Okay, so severe pain, someone who's just from theater, you may use narcotics within the critical hours after the patient has come from theater. Then for non-narcotics, these are used uh, to treat mild to moderate uh, pain. 
So types of analgesia, we continue. So these drugs are classified like this because of the way they act to elicit an effect in the body. You also need to know that narcotics, okay, they may cause a sedation, okay, whilst non-narcotics may not cause sedation. Okay, non-narcotics may have antipyretic effects, whilst narcotics do not have antipyretic effect. Okay, so non-narcotics, they have, uh, most of them, they have good, good anti-inflammatory properties, whilst narcotics uh, may not have good anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So those are some of the things that I feel that you should know about these drugs. So, the primary differences here being discussed about narcotic analgesics and non-narcotic analgesics. So narcotic analgesics, they act as sensory, whilst non-narcotic analgesics may act peripherally. Narcotic analgesics may cause addiction or dependence, whilst non-narcotic analgesia, not, they may not cause habit forming. Okay, when we talk of narcotic analgesia, they are found under the shade 2 and the 3 of controlled drugs. When you talk of non-narcotic analgesics, they are not controlled drugs. They can they are what we call over-the-counter drugs that you can even just buy. Notable adverse effects among this narcotic analgesia include sedation, respiratory depression, and breathing problems. When you talk of non-narcotic analgesia, Notable adverse effects include gastric irritation. When you talk of narcotic analgesia, they are they know they have no anti-inflammatory effect. When we talk of non-narcotics, they have anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, so those were the primary differences. So opioid analgesia relieve pain by acting directly on the central nervous system. Opioids are derived from or related to the opium. They bind to opioid receptors which are present in many regions of the nervous system and are involved in a pain signaling and control. Non-narcotics or non-opioid analgesia have principally analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory action. They act primarily in peripheral tissue to inhibit the formation of pain-producing uh, substances such as uh, prostaglandins. Non-opioids do not bind to opioid receptors and are not classified under the controlled uh, substances. They are milder forms of painkillers. Okay, paracetamol has analgesic and antipyretic properties, but no anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, are a group of drugs that have the capacity to induce analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory effect. Please kindly note that paracetamol does not have anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Okay, but when you're talking of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, most of them, if not all of them, they have antipyretic, anti-inflammatory, and analgesic effect. Okay, now the mode of action of non-narcotics. Okay, so the mode of action of non-narcotics is that cyclooxygenase enzyme catalyzes the conversion of alacdonic acid to endopeloxide which result into production of prostaglandin and a thromboxin. Okay, so this one, you can understand it more uh, nicely in a diagrammatic form when it's, uh, we try to illustrate that within our, our um, border lessons, okay? So it's cyclooxygenase, you know, after an insult or an assault to the tissue, it's cyclooxygenase enzyme that is going to um, catalyze that, that from um, from the word catalyst even so it's going to catalyze the conversion of alacdonic acids to endopeloxide which then results into the production of uh, prostaglandins and uh, thromboxin so these vasoactive mediators are responsible for pain and inflammatory uh, processes the cyclooxygenase enzyme inhibited by NSAIDs 
we are discovered to have at least uh, two different versions. So we have a cyclooxygenes 1 and the cyclooxygenes 2, abbreviated as COX-1 and COX-2. So NSAIDs work by blocking the cyclooxygenes enzyme, so inhibit production of prostaglandins and thromboxane, which are produced as part of the inflammatory response. COX-1 is a constitutive enzyme repeatedly present in the tissues and is responsible for production of protective prostaglandin in the gastrointestinal tract and the kidney. So COX-1 is always present. That is what you need to know. The cyclooxygenase 1 is, is a constitutive enzyme that is always present within the tissue. Okay, it is already present within the tissue and is responsible for the production of protective prostaglandin within that gastrointestinal tissue or the kidneys. But when COX-2 is, uh, is produced, this, is, this will come because there has been an assault to the tissue, okay? It is inducible, okay? So it's an inducible enzyme. So COX-2 enzyme, it's inducible, it's after an assault to a tissue. So there are enzymes which are formed during inflammation and pain. Okay, they are mainly present in the process of inflammation and are responsible for formation of uh, prostanoids or prostacyclines, prostaglandins, and thromboxins as part of the inflammatory response. So COX-2 inhibitors are used to relieve pain due to inflammation. Cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors block cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme that promotes inflammation. Cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme converts alacdonic acid uh, to prostaglandin, causing pain and inflammation. Okay, so that is in the normal in the normal way, but when we give the drug, it is going to inhibit uh, this process so that it. Uh, less prostaglandin is produced or no prostaglandin is produced so reduce the pain transmission, hence the analgesic effect. Acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin, okay, the therapeutic use include an inflammatory effect. It reduces the vessel director prostaglandin, that is E1 and E2, that results in reduced vessel dilatation and edema. The uses may include as antioxidant property, it's a free logical scavenger. It may be used in rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid fever. Analgesic effect, uh, use of aspirin, it reduces peripheral production of uh, prostaglandin, uh, thereby desensitizing the nerve endings to pain. It also reduces the production of prostaglandin centrally, thereby inhibiting pain stimulus at the subcortical site. Therapeutic uses used for mild to moderate pain as secondary to inflammation. For instance, arthritis, dysmenorrhea, and postpartum pain. Antipyretic effect of uh, uh, salicylic acid or acetyl salicylic acid. It reduces the production of prostaglandin E2, which is generated in a response to inflammatory pyogenes. Antipreterate effect uh, use of full aspirin. It leads uh, to irreversible inhibition of COX enzyme in preterate, leading to inhibition of uh, thromboxane synthesis and preterate aggregation inhibition. It is used in a prophylaxis of a transient ischemic attacks, myocardial infarction, and unstable angina. The dose of aspirin is available in 300 milligrams. Okay, okay. So anti-inflammatory, as anti-inflammatory, you can give 400 to 800 milligrams per day. As an algesia, you can give 300 to 600 milligrams of PRN, and as an anti Protelate, you can give 75 milligrams to 115 milligrams. Okay, so this we give uh, to prevent a stroke. So you can give as an anti a platelate. Okay, the side effects are uh, NSAID are predisposed to peptic ulcers, uh, renal failure, allergic reactions, and uh, occasionally healing loss. 
and they can increase the risk of hemorrhage by affecting platelet D function. The use of aspirin in children under 16 suffering from viral illness has been linked to Reiser syndrome, which is a rare but severe liver disorder. Okay, so now let us look at the profile of paracetamol. The exact mechanism of action of paracetamol or acetaminophen is uncertain, but appears to act centrally in the brain rather than peripherally in nerve endings like key NSAIDs. So the route of administration paracetamol is usually taken orally or laterally to relieve and reduce opioid consumption in the perioperative setting. The dose it is given per kg body weight in children, but for adults, 500 to 1 gram, uh, three times a day, it can be given. Adverse effect of paracetamol has few side effects and is regarded as generally a safe uh, drug, although excess or sustained use can lead to potentially life-threatening liver damage and occasionally kidney damage. Okay, so now let us look at narcotics or opioids. Narcotic analgesia are drugs that leave pain, can cause numbness and induce a state of unconsciousness. Morphine and its analogues and some synthetic derivatives are grouped as narcotic analgesics. Narcotic analgesics are used to leave acute chronic and severe pain. Some narcotics are more potent than others. They also have the tendency to cause tolerance and dependency. Narcotics here, mechanism of action. Narcotics, they act through the central receptors, which are responsible for the respiratory depression, okay, for euphoria and analgesia. They work by binding to opioid receptors, which are present in the central and the peripheral nervous system. Okay, there are three types of opioid receptors, which are all G protein linked and either facilitate opening of potassium channel, or uh, causing hyperpolarization, or inhibit calcium channel opening, so inhibit lease of excitatory neurotransmitters such as the substance P. Overall, narcotics analgesic reduce neuronal excitability in the pain carrying a pathway. Examples of opioid drugs are morphine, pethidine, codeine, and diamorphine. So here it's important that you know that when you give a narcotic, it has a three type of opioid receptors that it, which you work, it will work on, which are all G protein linked and either facilitate opening of um, potassium channel causing hyperpolarization or may inhibit channel, uh, calcium channel opening, so it will inhibit these of um, excitatory neurotransmitters or that of um, substance P. Opioid analgesia are a type of prescription drugs that are used for the medical purpose of relieving pain. When a person takes opioid analgesic outside of their medical use or in the increasing dosage and frequency without uh, talking to a doctor first, it becomes a prescription drug abuse. Opioid analgesics are used for people with a chronic pain or pain after undergoing a surgery. Opioid analgesics act on the brain by activating opioid receptors. By activating these receptors, opioid analgesics will increase the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. The increase in dopamine causes the intense feeling of happiness and pressure or euphoria that people feel when they use these drugs. Opioid analgesia also act on the brain by interfering with the transmission of pain. Okay, messages to the brain. Okay, the therapeutic use, uh, they, can, they are used like for codeine, they are used as copper suppressant, uh, also used uh, to treat moderate to severe pain, also used to reduce uh, motility of, of gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so they may cause constipation. So short-term side effects of uh, narcotics include um, 
The shorter term effects of opioid painkillers use may include a relaxation, a drowsiness, itching, a sweating, and dilated pupils. Others are vision problems, nausea, vomiting, and lack of concentration, constipation, anxiety, slowed breathing, fatigue, and a decreased appetite. Okay, the long-term side effects of uh, opioid painkiller may include uh, depression, insomnia, tolerance, and death from respiratory depression. For drug abusers, uh, may even because of needle exchange, may lead to HIV or hepatitis. Okay, from injectable drug abusers, and also may affect a uh, uh, pain threshold. So someone who have uh, decreased the uh, pain threshold. Okay, so now let us look at the, the second group of drug, and uh, the second group of drug that we are looking at is antibiotics. Okay, the first group of drugs that we are looking at are analgesia, and we have discussed the two types of analgesia, that is narcotic and non-narcotics. Okay, we talked about uh, uh, narcotic drugs being uh, morphine, uh, pethidine, and codeine, and how they are used. Okay, then uh, we also talked about NSAIDs uh, drugs. Okay, we talked about paracetamol, but exceptionally is uh, different from uh, other non-narcotics because it does not have anti-inflammatory properties, but it has the uh, analgesic effect, okay, and the uh, antipyretic effect. Okay, then um, we also gave examples of um, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin. All right, so now let us look at antibiotics as another class of drugs uh, that are used uh, within the hospital. Okay, antibiotics, also known as antibacterial, are types of medication that uh, destroy or slow down the growth of bacteria. The Greek word anti means against, and the Greek word bios means life, bacteria or a life form, so antibacterial. Okay, so anti against the bio life, bio bacterial life. Antibiotics are used to treat infection caused by bacteria. Their target mainly is the bacteria and they are not effective against the fungi, parasites, and the viruses. Okay, however, if antibiotics are overused or used incorrectly, there is a chance that the bacteria will become resistant, meaning the antibiotic becomes less effective against that type of bacterium. This is the reason why you have to learn about also the classification of antibiotics. Okay, so antibiotics are classified in two groups, namely bactericidal, cidal killing, okay, cidal bacteria, bactericidal. So these are antibiotics that kill the bacteria, you know, cidal, suicide, side kill. Okay, bacteriostatic, static at the same point. So bacteriostatic, these are antibiotics that prevent the growth and the multiplication over a bacteria. So static, they will prevent the growth and multiplication over the bacteria to facilitate the engulfing of those bacteria. So there are so many antibiotics and we will still discuss some, uh, you know, with our board lesson, okay? So under main classification of the groups here, we have sulfonamides, penicillins, and tetracyclines, but we are going to learn uh, in our board series, different types of antibiotics and the, the point at which they work. So we are going just to look at a few antibiotics that we might find within the national formula. Okay, so before selecting an antibiotic, you must consider the following. The patient and the known or likely causative organism. Okay, so when you are choosing an antibiotic, you need to know the patient okay and the organism of the or the cause of the disease okay you may need to know the history of allergy renal and hepatic function you also need to know the resistance of the drug to the infection okay then uh, the severity of the illness 
and ability to tolerate drugs by mouth. Okay, so this group of antibiotics that we are looking at are penicillins. So they are bactericidal and act by interfering with the bacterial wall synthesis. Okay, so they interfere uh, the bacteria so that it does not form the cell wall. If it does not form the cell wall, then the bacteria will die. So they diffuse well into body tissues and fluids, but penetration into cerebrospinal fluid is poor except when uh, the meninges are inflamed. Penicillins are active against gram-positive organisms and gram-negative cocci. The following are types of penicillins. We have benzyl penicillin or crystal pen or penicillin G. Indication is uh, given in tonsillitis uh, or titis uh, media, uh, streptococcal endocarditis, meningococcal and pneumococcal meningitis. The doses uh, you can uh, give intramuscularly or IV for infusion, 601.2 grams a daily in two to four divided doses. Of course, all these drugs we give according to the order by the physician. Okay, then in meningitis, uh, you can give by slow intravenous or infusion, 60 to 90 milligrams per kg body weight daily in four divided doses. For children, the doses may be similar, so you follow according to the pediatrician. But most it's given 20 to 40 milligrams per kg body weight in four divided doses. The side effect of, um, pen, of penvin, or sorry, of uh, benzyl penicillin, okay, includes sensitivity reactions, including urticaria, uh, fever, joint pains, and aphrastic shock, in hypersensitivity patients, and then contraindication is for those that have penicillin hypersensitivity. Okay, so then um, we have um, the other, this other type of penicillin that is um, benzathine penicillin. Presentation injection of this one, penicillin, okay, is uh, 475 milligrams, and then we have procaine penicillin. Okay, 250 milligrams, and then we have benzyl penicillin, sodium of 300 milligrams. So that is in benethamine uh, penicillin or triplo. Okay, so uh, try triplo, or that is we have three uh, types of drugs uh, in, within this uh, drug. So indication is a penicillin sensitive infection. Uh, it can be given by deep intramuscular injection. The contents of one vowel every two to three days. Okay, then we have benzathine penicillin. Indication, penicillin-sensitive infection, particularly this one is given in syphilis, uh, rheumatic fever, uh, as a prophylaxis. Uh, the dose, a uh, single dose of 2.4 mega units intramuscularly, rheumatic fever, prophylaxis of 1.2 mega uh, units I, uh, intramuscularly, monthly. Side effects, caution, and control those uh, contraindication as for benzyl, penicillin, or other penicillin for people who are hypersensitive, hypersensitive to uh, penicillin. Then we have phenoxymethyl penicillin. Phenoxymethyl uh, methyl penicillin is a pen V. Indication, mostly this one is given for upper respiratory tract infection. Okay, it's given for that, and uh, also it can be given in tonsillitis, otitis media, and uh, sinusitis. The doses are, are valuable in uh, 250 to 500 milligrams and given uh, six hours. Side effect are uh, more just like uh, any other penicillin hypersensitivity. Okay, then procaine penicillin uh, indication is penicillin sensitive infection, including syphilis and gas gangrene. Okay, adults, that is uh, 600 milligrams, uh, two times a daily. It's given also in syphilis. You can follow the algorithms uh, there for uh, managing syphilis. The side effect, same caution as for other penicillin. Then we have ampicillin. Ampicillin mostly is used for urinary tract infection. Okay, we are going to look at the... Um, and the antibiotic radar and 
rather and then we're going to see how these uh, drugs can be placed. So it's important you know that ampicillin is mostly used for urinary tract infection, otitis media, chronic bronchitis, or invasive salmonidiosis. The dose adult, it can be by oral 250 to 500 yeah, milligrams are given four times a day, okay, at least uh, 30 minutes uh, before food and can also be given intramuscularly or IV. Side effects, rashes, diarrhea, and uh, contraindication, sorry, a caution or contraindication as for other penicillin uh, to do with hypersensitivity to penicillin. Amoxacillin or amoxil is also similar to ampicillin. It is more active than ampicillin though. Uh, it's available in 250 milligrams and given eight hour day. Okay, it can be given in uh, aseptic ulcers. Okay, it can be given respiratory tract infection. So similar to ampicillin, uh, that is on side effects. Okay, then we have co amox club. Okay, so augmenting amoxicillin and clavionic acid. So similar to ampicillin. Okay. Resistant strains of Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So when you add the carbonic acid, okay, it will enhance uh, the work of amoxacid, um, amoxil, okay? So it becomes more of a stronger drug to work against the resistant uh, strains of Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, uh, Hemophilus influenza, okay? So the dose uh, 250 or 125 milligrams, 500 or 250 every six, eight hourly, the oral, and the side effect more the same like other penicillin. Then we have penicillin is resistant to penicillins like croxacillin, okay, or the other name that is obinin. So infections uh, due to penicillin is are uh, producing in uh, staphylococci. So for adults, you can give by mouth of 250 to 500, and it's given eight hour. So it's also available in intramuscular and IV injection. So child in a root under two year quota, that is under adults, you can always calculate according to the doctor's order. As for benzopenicillin, an oral administration may produce diarrhea and pruritus. So the side effect also for this one is the same. Um, contraindication also include hypersensitivity. Okay, so now let us now look at another group of antibiotic. Okay, we have looked at the penicillins. So now the another group of antibiotic is tetracyclines. Under tetracyclines, we have tetracycline as an example. We also have doxycycline as an example. So indication is um, exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, infection due to brucella, uh, infection due to chlamydia, mycoplasma, and alicacia, acne vulgaris, or cholera. Okay, so it can be given by mouth and it's available in uh, 250 to 500 milligrams and uh, can be given six hours in. Okay. Side effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, super infection with the resistant T organisms. Contraindication that is in renal failure, in pregnancy, and not to be used in children under 12 years of age because it may cause a dentition where there is coloring of dentition, the teeth just becomes yellow. Also, if the mother is breastfeeding, you might not to give because it can be plastic in breast milk and it may affect the tissue of the baby. So breastfeeding, avoid giving with the milk or calcium product as it will not be absorbed. Okay, it tends to form a crystal ball, crystal in the mouth, in the stomach. So doxycycline is an example of tetracycline. Okay, so the other name for doxycycline is vibramycin indication similar to tetracycline okay it can also be used in treatment of a sexually transmitted infection okay so initials we have 200 milligrams 50 milligrams are given as uh, uh, twice a daily side effects are similar to tetracycline contraindication are also similar to tetracycline because then we have another group of antibiotics known as aminoglycosides Okay, we have another group of 
antibiotics known as aminoglycosides. The mechanism of action of aminoglycosides, these are rapidly bactericidal. Bacterial killing is concentration dependent, but residue bactericidal activity exists even after the serum concentration has fallen below the minimum inhibitory concentration. So the properties account for the efficacy of once a daily dosing regimen. Aminoglycosides are potent bactericidal antibiotics that act by creating fissures in the outer membrane of the bacterial cell without any leakage of intracellular content and enhanced antibiotic uptake. This rapid action at the outer membrane probably accounts for most of the bactericidal activity. They are particularly active against aerobic gram-negative bacteria and act synergistically against a certain gram-positive organism. Gentamicin is an example of an aminoglycoside and is the most common user drug. But amicamycin may be particularly effective against resistant organisms. Aminoglycosides are used in the treatment of severe infection of the abdomen and urinary tract as well as bacteremia and endocarditis. They are also used for prophylaxis, especially against endocarditis. Okay, so gentamicin, indication, septicemia and neonatal sepsis, meningitis and other central nervous system infections bilirubin tract infection, acute polynephritis or prostatitis, endocarditis, okay? So these drugs, they are able to enhance the effect of them. They have a synergistic effect, okay? They enhance the effect of penicillin. So doses are average dose of 40 milligrams every eight hour side effect, irreversible partial or total deafness and vestibular disturbances. So reversible kidney damage, infrequently papula and anemia and convulsion can be seen at some of the side effects of gentamicin. Caution for someone who, is in, who has impaired renal function, uh, so meaning you have to use with caution or do not use, or should not be used in combination with a streptomycin. Okay, so now another aminoglycoside is a streptomycin. Streptomycin is used for the treatment of certain unusual infections, usually in combination with other antimicrobial agents. Because it is less active than other members of the class against aerobic gram and negative roads, it has fallen into disuse. So streptomycin is a use for the treatment of certain unusual infections, usually in combination with other uh, uh, antibacterial agent may also be administered by deep, deep intramuscular injection or intravenously. The dose of streptomycin is uh, 15 mg per kg per weight uh, daily for patients uh, with creatinine balance above 80 mL per minute. Um, it typically is administered as a 1000 mg single daily dose or 500 mg twice a daily. The daily dose should be reduced in proportion to creatinine clearance for creatinine clearance uh, that is for creatinine for creatinine clearance okay that is above uh, 30 um, 30 30 mils per minute amicamycin is also another example of um, for another example of um, Aminoglycoside. The spectrum of antibacterial activity of amicamycin or amikin is the broadest of the group. Because of its resistance to many aminoglycoside inactivating enzymes, it has a special role in hospitals where gentamicin and tobramycin resistant organisms are prevalent. The recommended dose of amicamycin is 15 mg per kg body weight as a single uh, daily dose or divided into two or three equal portions, which must be reduced for patients with the renal failure. The drug is absorbed rapidly after intramuscular injection, but is usually given intravenously. Neomycin, 
Okay, so neomycin is a broader spectrum antibiotic, a gram and negative species that are highly sensitive, like E. coli, Enterobacter, aerogenes, Krebsella, pneumonia, and the Proteus vulgaris. Gram positive microorganisms that are inhibited include uh, Streptococcus aureus and um, uh, e. Coli, uh, that is E. ficaris, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, also is sensitive uh, to neomycin. Also, strains of uh, pneumo pneumonia aeruginosa are resistant to ne neomycin. Then uh, we have erythromycin. Okay, that is alternative to penicillin in penicillin sensitive patient. Uh, that is it. sinusitis, uh, diphtheria, and looping cough uh, as prophylaxis for regionaries a disease. This drug can be given. Adult doses are available in 250 to 500 milligrams every six hours, up to four grams a daily in severe infection. Side effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and this may be seen mostly after large doses. Okay, so now we have uh, quinolones. Quinolone is another group of antibiotics. These are fluorinated for um, quinolones, such as ciprofloxacin, uh, cipro, okay, moxifloxacin, avelox, and gatifloxacin, tequin, are orally effective for the treatment of a wide variety of infection or of infectious diseases and have relatively few side effects. The mechanism of action of uh, quinolones, here they target bacterial DNA gyrus and uh, toposomeres, okay? For many gram-positive bacteria, toposomeres is the primary uh, target. For many uh, gram-negative bacteria, uh, for many gram-negative uh, bacteria, DNA gyrus is the primary quinolone target as illustrated in the figure here. So quinolone inhibits so quinolone inhibits the so, so we're saying the flow low quinolones are potent bactericidal agents so okay against a broad variety of microorganisms as outlined under therapeutic uses. So for quinolone and quinolones are different types of antibiotics, okay? Though sometimes they are discussed uh, together. Otherwise, when you look at their structure, fluoroquinolones are different from quinolones. So fluoroquinolones have good activity against staphylococci, but not against uh, methicillin resistant uh, strains. Okay, so ciprofloxacin, okay, the quinolone there, okay? System, many systemic infection, respiratory and the urinary tract infection, bone and joint infection, it is used. The doses in which it is available include uh, 250 to 750 milligrams. Side effects include nausea, uh, diarrhea, rash, pruritis. Special precautions here, adequate fluid intake is necessary to avoid uh, uh, crystalluria. Okay, so then another group of antibiotic uh, that we also need to look out for is a chloranthenico. Okay, so chloranthenico is a group of drug and uh, chloranthenico is a, a drug that is found under chloranthenicos. So the indication include a typhoid fever, open cough, hemophilus uh, uh, infections, meningitis, and anaerobic infection. Of course, do not use for trivial infection because this is one of uh, those powerful antibiotics that we have around. Add out uh, 250 to 500 milligrams IM or orally uh, every six hours can be given. Side effects include a plastic anemia, it has got bone separation activity, okay, sensitization, gastrointestinal disturbances. Contraindication for chloranthenico include a pregnancy to avoid a gray syndrome. Okay, baby gray syndrome, breast feeding for mothers, and then active immunization. So here yeah, you need to note that there is a contraindication. Then um, the next uh, group of drugs here under antibiotics is sulfonamides and trimethoprim. 
Okay, so phonamides and trimethoprim combinations are used to prevent and treat infection. Sulfadazine and trimethoprim combination is used to treat infections such as urinary tract infection, bronchitis, middle ear infection, and traveler's diarrhea. Okay, it is also used for the prevention and the treatment of pneumocystis, carinae, or gerevesi pneumonia. However, in my geographical setting, sulfamethazole and trimethoprim combination is strictly used in patients with HIV-related infection as it helps to slow down the progression of HIV infection before starting antiretroviral therapy. The regimen sometimes change this time, okay, they just commence antiretroviral drugs and the septrin can be given when the need has been assessed. Unless indicated, the sulfonamides and trimethoprim combinations are indicated for invasive salmonidiosis, typhoid fever, bone and joint infection, okay, or that may be due to hemophilus influenza, urinary tract infections, or sinusitis, okay, in gonorrhea, in chronic bronchitis, or in penicillin sensitive patients, and also can be used in tankloid. Those are by mouth, you can give two tablets, that is 960 milligrams every 12 hours. Side effects include nausea, vomiting, skin rashes, blood, uh, blood, this uh, blood dyscrasis, uh, reduction in renal and hepatic function. Contraindication of this in pregnancy, especially the first three months. Okay, infants under uh, six weeks, uh, severe hepatic or, or renal insufficiency. So these uh, drugs are not given in the first, in the first um, three months, okay, first trimester. Sulfonamide and trimethoprim combination are best taken with a full glass of water to help prevent some unwanted effects of um, these sulfonamides like renal stone formation. So you encourage the patient to take a lot of water. Okay, so then uh, the other group of antibiotics that we need to look at is nitrofulantoin or fulladantin. Indication in urine, urinary tract infection. Okay, it's available in 50 to 150 milligrams. So nitrofilantoin, okay, it's a group of drugs and we have nitrofilantoin as a drug. Given QID with food, okay. A side effects include foreign neuro, neuro, neuropathy and desensitization. Contraindication, impaired renal function. Okay, so... In the next uh, part of the lesson, we will start looking at, uh, we will also look at antiviral as the third group of drugs because we are looking at six types uh, of drugs. So we have discussed antibiotics, we have discussed different types of antibiotics, and uh, in our board uh, lessons, uh, we we are going to record the lesson where we talk about the antibiotic radar and then we are also going to talk about where the mechanism of action and the groups of these antibiotics. So we are going to discuss that within our uh, board lesson or tutorial. So in this comprehensive uh, lesson, we have just discussed these types and uh, some properties that we need to know about these uh, drugs. So the next lesson will be about antiviral agents. Okay, so that will be the next lesson on the groups or classification of drugs. Uh, the simple understanding of this diagram is that um, uh, the simple understanding of this diagram is that here we have uh, the virus. Okay, so the virus is attached to the cell wall. So this uh, black line represents the cell wall of the host cell. Okay, then uh, this cup seed, okay, this uh, cup seed, okay, during fusion is the one that is released inside the hot cell. So this uh, yellow part here is the cup seed. Okay, so the cup seed carries uh, the, the DNA information, also the RNA information 
of the HIV virus. Okay, it carries the DNA material, okay, or the the the, the RNA material of the virus. So these will be released. So we have the HIV RNA. So when this HIV RNA has been released, with the help of the reverse transcriptase, okay, so this arrow is showing that with the help of reverse transcriptase, the HIV RNA will be converted into the HIV DNA or it will be synthesized to come up with the HIV uh, DNA. Okay, so this is a DNA component or material. So uh, HIV, so the, the RNA is one strand, okay? So when a, when a DNA material has been formed, it becomes double-stranded, okay? So we have the HIV double-stranded uh, DNA material. So now when it reaches the nucleus, entering the nucleus, okay, when it enters the nucleus, so in the nucleus, that is where we have the host DNA, which is formed. So in the host nucleus, okay, of course, this black line is indicating the nucleus. So in the host, uh, host um, nucleus, the double-stranded HIV DNA material is going to be incorporated to the uh, host uh, DNA, okay, using the enzyme integrase. So reverse transcriptase here, uh, changing the HIV RNA to a double-stranded HIV DNA, okay, then we have integrase in the nucleus here, combining the new formed HIV DNA material into the host DNA. So when you look at this part here, Okay, it's different from this host DNA material, which is the yellow, okay, in this representation. So the, there is insertion of the host, the, into the host genome, okay, of this virus. So when uh, this has been done, so this DNA material will be influenced to produce HIV messenger RNA, okay. So when these HIV messenger RNA are produced, so we have these HIV messenger RNA, okay, they will come out, okay, and as they come out, they also, they find other proteins within the cytoplasm, okay, of other protein materials that are needed for the, for the virus. So with the help of the protease enzyme, it is going to cut long HIV proteins, okay, into HIV precursor proteins. So here, at the bottom of the cell, we have HIV long, longer uh, proteins, okay, that come out from there. So when um, the protein enzyme works on these HIV proteins, it's going to cut them into smaller ones that are needed for the virus. Okay, so now the, the HIV uh, RNA that has now been produced is going to assemble with the uh, HIV precursor proteins here to form new virus. So when the new virus has been formed, then it buds out here, okay, as a new virus by acquiring an envelope, okay. So that is the, how the HIV virus uh, necessarily replicates. So when we are trying to block in pharmacology, okay, we bring in some inhibitors here to stop fusion or to stop attachment, okay? Or if here we, the virus has entered, we can use non-reverse transcriptase, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So here, so nucleoside is a protein material that is needed for DNA. So we can try to block this conversion of HIV RNA to HIV DNA. If we fail to block this, we can try within the nucleus to block the combination of HIV DNA material into the whole DNA by uh, building a drug known as an integrase inhibitor. Okay, so if it fails here, then we can also try to stop the proteins, the 
conversion of HIV long proteins into HIV precursor proteins by uh, coming up with a protease inhibitor, okay, drug here, okay. So that is the, how now the virus after being released here the, from the nucleus, we, it comes into the cytoplasm here of the cell. We have the precursor, then there is assembly, then there is a movement out of the, uh, or budding out of the virus, budding out of the virus. So that is how we should understand the steps here of the virus and also the pharmacological actions uh, that are supposed to be done.